Have you ever noticed, whenever we're talking fasting, we're talking in Fs? I mean, IF, TRF, ADF, ED, OF. What the F? That last one, always everyone's favorite. Guys, what is up? Welcome back to a, another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic manner. This week, we are having a Fasting 101 edition where we're gonna dig into some new and interesting research around every other day feeding, AKA alternate day fasting. And at this point, I'm gonna make a decision with the hat, whether to, I don't know, what do you think? Hat, no hat, uh, no hat it is. I might put it back on later. As we all know, or we should know by now, metabolic disease is an increasing burden on modern society, raising both morbidity and mortality rates across the globe. One form of intervention that we've talked about, you know, quite extensively on this channel that is being used to combat this rise in morbidity and mortality is some form of nutrient deprivation. And when we're talking nutrient deprivation, we're really talking, you know, one of three strategies. Chronic calorie restriction, time restricted feeding, and intermittent fasting. Got no food, we got no jobs. Our pets' heads are falling off! They're all a little bit different and they all bring some unique benefits, but the gist of it is sort of all the same. It's a particular intervention that we can all use to try and get a little healthier, to increase our longevity, our health span over time. Plenty of other videos and content on this channel all about that. I'll link it all below. You can check it out. Suggest you go check out the Fasting 101 playlist. That's a good place to start. So today we are looking at some new animal research that highlights the metabolic changes that occur in mice when they partake in every other day feeding, AKA alternate day fasting, which we've also spoke a lot about on this channel. Highlighted by my six month ADF extravaganza. But before we dive into that research, a couple of primers. There's a lot of research out there that indicates that fasting is very powerful. And many people who implement some type of protocol see results. That's why it's gaining such steam. Previous animal models have associated ADF with improved insulin sensitivity, reduced fasting blood glucose levels, decreases in total blood cholesterol, and increased lifespan. Not bad. All, might I add, in the absence of any weight loss. I know, <laughs> right? For some reason, I think that most people would want to see that weight loss factor as well. Just a guess. P.S. ADF has shown some very interesting results in the limited, well thought out human research as well. But human studies are hard. Hard to do right. Hard to control. Hard to get approvals for. Unless, of course, you're doing them on yourself. You can check out the results of my personal six week ADF experiment going into the weeds on a lot of different factors, including sleep and blood work, right? Links are also below. Okay, enough with the humans. Let's go to the mice. For this study, in mice, researchers used a multi-omics approach, which considers multiple data sets, such as total collections of proteins and genes. And they use this approach to identify specific alterations due to every other day feeding when compared to ad libitum feeding in mice. And I'm gonna keep saying it, in mice. So this analysis focused on the key differences between the two groups, and specifically the changes that occurred in their livers, which many would call the master regulator when it comes to energy homeostasis, which makes it a key part and a likely mediator of many of the beneficial effects when it comes to intermittent fasting. So what exactly were the research methods? Cause this matters. This is how you can tell good research from shitty research to examine the effects of intermittent fasting on the mice. Researchers implemented an EODF every other day feeding protocol in male mice at eight weeks of age, essentially when they turned 21 in mouse years. The mice on the EODF diet were given access to chow for 24 straight hours, 
followed by a removal of all chow for the subsequent 24 hours. Pretty straightforward, right? Now mice in the ad libitum group were giving free access to chow whenever they please. Lucky mice. Maybe not in the long run, but for the immediate, you know, food loving mice. Yeah, lucky mice. This EODF cycle was repeated for 12 days. So right there in my eyes, you know, it's a little bit of a limitation because it's a pretty short study, but the show goes on. So during this time, mice were given an oral glucose tolerance test on days seven and eight, and biopsies of the liver were done in both groups after feeding and fasting days. Just to give you a little perspective here, there were north of 4,100 specific proteins analyzed in the samples collected. So, all right, the results. Here are some of the expected and non-expected outcomes. EODF mice were significantly more glucose tolerant. They had fasting insulin levels that were significantly lower than their ad libitum counterparts. Total plasma levels of insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1, were significantly downregulated in the EODF mice, even more so than typically observed in chronic calorie restriction studies, which is pretty damn interesting. And in terms of longevity, having a lower long-term expression of growth factors like IGF-1 and growth hormone in general tend to be correlated with an increase in longevity. Just saying. But what about weight loss? Everyone loves weight loss, unless it's gain season. Well, throughout, you know, the limited 12 days, there were no significant changes in weight. Even with the EODF mice eating basically double in the days that they had access to food. And I can personally attest to this very factor because I embarked and basically just finished up on a six month alternate day fasting protocol where I guarantee I ate double on my feeding days. And weight was steady, very steady throughout. I actually saw jumps of almost 10 pounds every two days. And that accounts to just food in your intestines, in your system, and the water weight. So basically after feeding days, the night of a feeding day, I would probably be in, you know, around 190 pounds. And then mornings after a full day fasting, about 42 total hours, you know, right before I was about to break the fast, the alternate day fast, I'd be at, you know, 182, 181, somewhere around there. And that's before I hydrate up and things like that, but definitely noticeable. Definitely an interesting observation that I go into in that video I referenced earlier. Back to these results. As an added bonus in all this, there was an uptake in activation of oxidative stress defenses. Now, when it comes to the liver, there were many distinct changes in the EODF group after that full day of fasting. The analysis showed an unexpected downregulation in HNF4A targets, which is a protein that regulates a lot of genes in the liver. Suppressed HNF4A targets include bile synthetic enzymes and a number of inflammatory factors. And you know me, I'll take lower inflammation any day of the week, every day of the week. Other interesting results showed significant EODF regulated decreases in key proteins involved in very low density lipoprotein, VLDL production otherwise known as one of the lipoproteins that is highly associated with endothelial damage and cardiovascular risk. And lastly, as one might predict, there was an upregulation in many mitochondrial proteins associated with fatty acid oxidation in that EODF group. And that basically tells us the mice were getting ready for a little keto time. You know, keto time is a fun time. It's always good to mix in a little keto time here and there. So what does this all mean? One of the main points that I draw from this just pure abundance of data, and there was a lot of it, a lot of data in this research, I will, as always, link it all below, is that the numbers on the scale barely tell 1% of the story when it comes to gauging the effectiveness of a new intervention. Yes, the numbers might change, and hopefully they'll go down if that's your goal, but there's so much more going on at the molecular and biochemical level. It's just plain ignorant to use a weight measurement as the main factor for success. Secondly, and this reiterates what we've talked about in a lot of other videos, and that's the fact that 
fasting is a powerful, powerful intervention. It's been a key part of our evolution, not really by choice, but it's been there and it's been key for survival. So whether it's time-restricted feeding over the course of 24 hours, whether it's intermittent fasting, a protocol like ADF, or even adding a few strategic prolonged fasts into the mix, it's something that you may want to explore if you're really trying to optimize health. And lastly, I want to reiterate that it's not a one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to picking a specific protocol. Everybody's different. It's finding something that works for you that fits into your lifestyle. And what works today may not work tomorrow. When your body becomes accustomed to a specific intervention, a plateau, so to say, switching it up or cycling through fasting and non-fasting regimens very well could be the optimal path of action. So all that being said, that's what I got. This was some super interesting research on ADF showing that it has some pretty distinct effects when compared to time-restricted feeding and ab libitum feeding. Remember, this was an animal model. Always consult your doctor. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Keep investing in you.